Ladies and gentlemen, gender nonconforming and trans deities, thank you for tuning in to the Hood Wazee. We are Chicago and the country's only live uh, and live stream radical news show on culture and politics, disseminating block optic and uh, radical perspectives on culture and politics. I'm your host, Ricardo Gamboa, and you are now watching or uh, in uh, the Hood Wazee's Teach In series, uh, Liberation in Black and Tan. Um, so as many of you know, this uh, teaching series was something uh, me and the team threw together in response to the eruption of black and brown racial tensions and brown on black violence in the wake of George Floyd protests. And uh, we are so excited to bring in Latinx professors from across the country uh, to our audience here in Chicago and also uh, across the country um, to break down some of the, uh, some of the topics um, that were underpinning that movement as well as help us think on how we can move forward. So I'm done talking. I, I do it too much and I'm just a pretty face with the dimple chin. Um, but I do want to get into this next session, which is um, between antagonism and co-imagining, understanding black-brown relations. Uh, and it is taught by an awesome professor. She is the Collins Professor of Indigenous Race and Ethnic Studies and Geography at the University of Oregon, uh, where she studies race, activism, environmental justice, and cultural memory. Uh, she came to Oregon from California, uh, where she was immersed in struggles for economic, uh, racial, and environmental justice in LA. So here's a shout out to all my Little Village environmental justice organizations and uh, Southeast Chicago moms that have been holding it down for environmental justice. I thought you, would, uh, you all would extra appreciate this guest. Um, she's also uh, authored numerous books, including uh, Environmentalism for Economic Justice, Two Chicano Struggles in the Southwest, uh, Black, Brown, Yellow, and Left Radical Activism in Los Angeles, and uh, People's Guide to Los Angeles, uh, among others. And uh, currently she's working on a historical atlas uh, of, of, of the foundational white supremacy. She is Laura Pulido, and let's give it up for Laura with uh, all your hand clap emojis, our likes, our hearts, our care emojis, whatever you want. And I'll let Laura take it away from here. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to be here with you today. I'm delighted to be part of this larger conversation. I think it's always important to talk about the relationships between black and brown peoples, but especially at this watershed moment. I know that in this teaching, there have been presentations on black and brown solidarity, Mexicans in the US racial formation, and Latinx and anti-blackness. I have been asked to speak specifically on different kinds of relationships between black and brown people. Um, including conflict, cooperation, and how we co-imagine together, even when we don't always realize it. I want to thank Ricardo for organizing this teaching. I think that understanding dynamics between various people of color is incredibly important um, for building movements for racial justice. Um, this is something that the mainstream press really um, rarely covers, um, and when it does, it's treated in a very su superficial fashion. I know, for example, today, on NPR, there was a discussion with uh, both Latinx and a, um, an Asian American, uh, two guys around how these different populations are kind of intersecting or engaging in this moment. And it was actually, she was questioning like, you know, like, do you have any role? Or people even suggesting like, we don't have a role. And this is like, that's like so crazy. Um, so I think it's really important that we dig in. Um, Cause if you think about it, I think racial solidarity among people of color is one of the keys to achieving racial justice in the United States. Most of the attention is focused on the black-white binary, as we have seen the last several weeks, which is certainly very important. Um, but if black, indigenous, and people of color could unite, we could effectively challenge white supremacy. Now, I have no illusions that all black and brown people would unite, or even a majority, but that's okay. We only need an organized vocal minority. I think the white supremacists say you only need 3% to make a revolution. Um, what we need is people who are willing and able to offer a different framework to their families and communities, an explicitly anti-racist one. We need people willing to acknowledge and work through the differences, disagreements, and points of unity. And with a shift in consciousness, as well as an oppositional activist infrastructure, I think we could have a major impact. It was my desire to understand all these dynamics that led me to study racial activism and inter-ethnic relations for the last 30 years. So what I'm gonna to do today is I'm gonna share one of my research projects with you, in which I examine how black and brown people co-imagine political futures. I argue that neat definitions of black and or Latinx activism are overly simplistic. And if we look closely, we can see all kinds of connections. Because in fact, we shape each other in ways both large and small through co-imagining. 
So what I'm going to do first is talk about different models for understanding relationships between African Americans and Latinx peoples, including conflict and competition, cooperation, and then co-imagining. As part of the co-imagining, I will share some maps on the geography and history of brown and black um, exchanges that I have documented in the United States. So let me begin with some of the ways that scholars have conceptualized black and brown relationships, beginning with conflict. conflict. Um, before I do that, I wanna offer a caveat. I am treating Latinx and African Americans as two separate categories, which overlooks, of course, the experience of Afro-Latinx peoples and communities. This is a weakness, I think, in my work, which I was not able to address five years ago when I collected this data. Um, nevertheless, um, I hope this talk encourages us to rethink some of these conventional boundaries in multiple kinds of ways. Now, one of the oldest approaches to studying relationships between African Americans and Latinx peoples, especially Mexicans, is competition and conflict. And this became very popular in the 1980s as the Latinx population began exploding. Basically, competition and conflict are two ways of understanding hostility and tensions between these two groups of peoples. So, as the name implies, Competition is the idea that Latinxes and African Americans, as the two leading minority groups, are competing with each other. They're competing for political power, jobs, limited state resources, white respect, genuine membership in the nation, competing for who is the most aggrieved, competing for the position of civil rights leaders. And for example, I think the book of Nicholas Vaca is a wonderful example um, of that. Much of the competition argument is rooted in demographics. African Americans have been, of course, the largest racial minority or minoritized population for centuries, and thus have attracted far more attention historically. And now Latinxes are the largest group. Some refer to this demographic change as the Latino tsunami or the browning of America. Critics of this approach call it demographic determinism. And they argue, just because you have the numbers does not mean you're destined to dominate. And I actually think that's true. Besides numbers, the black experience is, um, well, historically black numbers, the black experience is central to all of the US. In contrast, I think until relatively recently, the Latinx experience has been smaller, more regional, and as well as diverse. It's important to understand that it's precisely the centrality of the black experience that has also led to competition. Latinxes often feel and resent that they are in the shadow of African Americans. The Black experience often defines things, and Latinxes are supposed to somehow fit into that racial framework, when in fact we may have our own reality. Now, related to competition is conflict. And sometimes conflict stems from competition, but not always. For example, we know that some Latinx people are anti-Black. Um, and it's important to understand that although anti-Blackness is universal, its specificity is shaped by geography and history. Consequently, we can point to several distinct racial processes that animate Latinx anti-Blackness. One, of course, is the white supremacy um, emanating from Latin America, um, which came with European colonization. Um, and many immigrants bring this with them when they come to the United States. But even without Latinx immigration, um, we see within the US racial formation itself, going back to you know, the annexation of Mexico in 1848, Latinx people have a particular position in the U.S. racial structure as part of what has been often called the racial middle. And I think Josie Saldana talked about this yesterday. A third dynamic, which kind of bridges the two, is when Latinx people, like other immigrants, wish to become American by subordinating black people. And this has been one of the key ways in which many immigrant groups, such as um, the Irish, Italians, become white, right, through um, embracing white supremacy. Um, this is very clearly a form of white supremacy insofar as when Latinx immigrants do it, they are reproducing a racist structure in which black people are at the bottom and obviously whiteness is validated. In other cases, Latinx people more directly aspire to whiteness. This likely comes from the Latin American overvaluation of whiteness as well as the denigration of indigeneity and blackness. And if you come from, um, I don't know, I can only speak for myself, coming from a Mexican um, background, the, which I heard all the time about, you know, Blancas versus the Morenos and the different kinds of, you know, um, uh, clearly uh, aspiration of uh, evaluation of whiteness. Um, one example of Latinx white supremacy comes from LULAC, 
the League of United Latin American Citizens. Through much of the 20th century, LULAC leaders in Texas resisted efforts to categorize Mexicans as colored or non-white. Um, local health, health authorities had begun categorizing Mexicans as colored in the 1930s. But LULAC insisted that they were white and therefore subject to all the privileges of white people. So instead of challenging the racial hierarchy, LULAC bought into white supremacy to improve their own position. Well, further subordinating their black brothers and sisters. Thankfully, that has changed, but that gives you an idea of what some form of what some Latinx folks people have done in the past. And we can point to many other sources of evidence of this, such as certainly survey data. Um, I think there, when we look at the extent to which Latinx people um, are supporting um, black struggles, um, there are always some, but it's a really, really small minority that we can point to. We can think about um, Latinx police officers and their abuse and violence towards, um, towards black um, uh, civilians, right? There's many different spheres, I think, in which this exists. There has also been conflict and hostility on the part of some African Americans toward Latinx people, especially immigrants. During the 1990s, there was a major rise in anti-immigrant sentiment, and this was epitomized, uh, arguably, by Proposition 187 in California. And this was an effort that would have banned immigrants from many social and health services in the state. And it was so popular, it was replicated in many states and actually then also became part of federal policy. Well, many black people opposed such attacks. Numerous high profile people actually advocated for it. This included Jamal Shaw's family, who used his death as a rallying point for anti-immigration policy. In 2008, high school senior Jamal Shaw was murdered by Pedro Espinosa, an unauthorized immigrant. Um, his distraught family, working with anti-immigrant forces, became proof of how black people were hurt by immigration and that anti-immigrant activists were not racist. So this was really important in thinking about the kind of ideological work that black bodies performed in terms of bolstering um, the position of white um, anti-immigrant activists. Together, they wrote Jamil's Law, which sought to rescind Special Order 40. Um, and Special Order 40 was very important because what it did is it prohibited law enforcement from inquiring about immigration status whenever they questioned somebody. So clearly this was an effort to reduce um, you know, deportations. Black radio personalities, black politicians, and um, some black activists took up this cause, right? Um, and 10 years later, we can see the Shaw family and they are still actively supporting Trump and have appeared in news commercials for him as well as speaking at his rallies. Now, I don't want to suggest that these two forms of hostility are equal, because I don't think they are. I think Latinx people have engaged in white supremacy far more than black people have engaged, have been anti-immigrant. We have repeatedly shown our willingness to buy into white supremacy, either as a way of addressing discrimination or to create more opportunity for ourselves. Regardless, I think the roots of this conflict are the same. It is precipitated by a desire for inclusion, inclusion in the nation and inclusion in whiteness. And inclusion is desired because of systematic exclusion and subordination. So I think it's very important when we think about a lot of our political strategies and that so often they are about inclusion um, without questioning what we are trying to buy our way into or get our way into. Now the flip side of conflict competition is solidarity and cooperation. Numerous scholars point to the long history of solidarity between the two groups, especially Mexicans which we can trace back to at least the 1800s, um, when Mexico, for example, offered a safe haven to black slaves. And I know Paul Ortiz discussed some of this in history yesterday, so I won't spend too long on it. In addition to the various moment, movements he discussed, scholars have analyzed deep cultural connections and influence as seen in music, dance, and literature. But perhaps the most well-known moment of political inspiration and solidarity is between the Black Panthers, the Chicano Brown Berets, and the Puerto Rican Young Lords. These connections existed throughout the U.S., but especially in cities like New York, Chicago, and L.A. While it is essential to know this history, I also think it can be overblown at times. Sometimes in our effort to stress solidarity as a way kind of like, here's what we can do, right? This is the way forward. We tend to be celebratory and overlook the very real tensions and differences that do exist between our populations. But pretending those things don't exist is not going to actually lead us to, I think, genuine forms of solidarity and empowerment and building political capacity. We have to have the tools, knowledge, and capacity to really deal with those differences. 
Now, the final approach I wish to discuss is what Ricardo called co-imagining. So I thank him from that term. I had actually kind of been using that idea, but I didn't have a good way of explaining it. So thank you. Now, co-imagining is located in relational ethnic studies. Um, instead of focusing on differences and similarities between various groups, which is really the province of what we call comparative ethnic studies, relational ethnic studies explores how various groups impact and shape each other. This is a fundamental shift in how we study the relationships between non-white groups. Not only are Latinxes and African Americans shaped by white racism, but we also produce conditions, events, and discourses that impact each other. I'm interested in how brown and black communities have shaped each other through political struggle. In order to understand political struggle, we first need to start with political consciousness. Now, political consciousness is the precondition for activism. Political consciousness refers to such things as, how do people become aware of injustices? How do they interpret them? Who do they see as responsible? Who are, what are their proposed solutions? Who might they partner with? How and why do individuals come to believe that they should publicly act? And how do they make the transition from a private individual to a public activist? Thinking through these questions goes hand in hand with activism and shapes the nature of social movements. We are living in a time where political consciousness is shifting at this very moment, as a growing majority acknowledges that anti-Black racism exists. John Marquez, who teaches at Northwestern, argues that Latinx people's oppositional political consciousness draws heavily from the Black experience. He coined the term foundational Blackness to describe how Latinxes absorb a Black political consciousness. Whether consciously or not, we're influenced by the discourses, movements, frameworks, and strategies of African Americans and the larger Black radical tradition. I know this is true from my own personal experience, which I shared earlier, including things like Harriet Tubman who is very much a part of the Black radical tradition. But of course, foundational Blackness exists on a massive scale, right? Not only across, certainly across the United States, but as well as other places around the globe as well. This is because anti-Blackness has shaped this place that we now call the U.S. since the dawn of slavery, which was itself a global system. Well, there's no denying the importance of foundational Blackness. The exchange of political consciousness is actually a two-way street. Latinx people carry in us a deep history of anti-colonial struggle, class consciousness, anti-racist struggle, and resistance to authoritarian regimes and state genocide. We can call this a decolonial imaginary for short, borrowed from both Emma Perez and as well as Minolo. In order to better understand this dynamic, I decided to kind of make a list and map out these exchanges in the United States, or at least the continental United States. I made a list of all the different instances of radical political solidarity I could find between brown and black people um, up to 2014. I identified about 150 instances of crossover between the two groups. Now I want to be clear, this is not a comprehensive list of brown-black solidarity. Not only did I miss some, but I also had a very limited kind of criteria. They had to be explicitly oppositional, as in, you know, Let's systematically challenge uh, economic relations, racism, and other forms of domination. We have to change the whole power structure, right? Consequently, I excluded service providers, such as community groups involved in feeding hungry people, which is important, but I don't consider that to be um, you know, oppositional. I excluded electoral campaigns, with the exception of Jesse Jackson's 1980 campaign, um, which I really did feel to be quite an anomaly and not in any way, uh, shape or form, a typical electoral campaign. I also excluded religious activities, um, which may often contain some level of political consciousness, although I think rarely are they oppositional in nature. I think one of the big examples of this are, are, uh, would be um, Reverend Barber in North Carolina these days. And his, uh, for many years, he was doing his Moral Mondays, and he's still, I think, organizing a major event um, in the coming week or so. Um, so he has really done tremendous work, I think, in terms of building um, you know, multiracial kinds of, of formations. So I focus on very explicit, overt forms of oppositional struggle, ones in which historical connections can be found between movements and activists. When you start thinking about political activism and social movements in this way, history and racial lines quickly become murky, which is what I really want to do. I want to show how we shape each other 
And if you recognize that we shape each other, not only do you realize the connections between racially subordinated peoples, but you begin to see the possibilities for continued collaboration. This is not meant to erase the distinctiveness of either group's experience, but to get us to think in more complicated terms, to think of us as co-imagining a future together. Sometimes we co-imagine in really bad ways, <laughs> um, but sometimes and oftentimes we do it in really positive ways as well. Um, now I identified four different forms, when I looked at all the data, I identified four different forms of exchange and solidarity. They are um, partial consciousness, borrowing, conscious collaboration, and multiracial organizations. Now the first one is partial consciousness. This is a borrowing and or exchange that people are not always fully cognizant and aware of. Because they see each other regularly and often live in close proximity, ideas and practices spread between black and brown peoples. And this is really important and can happen in numerous ways. Sometimes we are inspired by the actions of others. Sometimes without any coordination, we create conditions that support each other's struggles. This often happens when communities face structurally similar circumstances, such as police abuse or environmental racism. Now the fourth and final group uh, category that I found was multiracial organizations. And these are organizations which decide, which decide that partnership is not enough and that they need to change their model to include others as well. Um, and these may uh, result through mergers or they may develop after a history of formal collaboration or even as kind of a next generation project. Typically activists see the limitations of single group organizing. And this I think is especially common in big cities. I mean, my work in Los Angeles, African-Americans, I think as many black activists, they feel their concerns get lost among multiracial organizations and they need to have their own space in which their own issues and concerns can become prioritized. So in many ways, I think this is a big weakness we have seen with, uh, uh, from multiracial organizations, um, the larger kind of framing, right, of people of color in which African-Americans um, feel their issues get subsumed in various kinds of ways by other groups. So I want you to keep these differences in mind as we look at these maps that I have. Um, these show uh, the distribution of co-imagining events from 1900 to 2014. Now, one of the things that quickly stands out is the importance of big cities. New York, LA, San Francisco clearly lead the way um, and Chicago to a lesser extent. It really is in urban areas where this kind of intense cross fertilization takes place. In cities, people are living in relatively close proximity. They are aware of what other groups are doing, and they are often in structurally similar positions, which greatly facilitates the possibility of exchange. So I would like to focus on one very important story, which I think shows a lot of historical loops, and that is Mendes versus Westminster. This is a very famous court case that focused on school segregation. In Orange County, which is now an LA suburb, Mexican children were segregated. The Westminster School District justified segregation because Mexican children supposedly did not speak English. In 1943, a group of parents with English-speaking children sued. The judge ruled, well, if you're segregating kids on the basis of language, well, then you got to administer them a language test, which would make sense. The school board did not like that because, of course, they didn't want any Mexican kids, regardless of language. So they appealed the decision. Now, this appeal attracted significant attention including amicus briefs from the NAACP, the Japanese American Citizens League, the ACLU, and the American Jewish Congress, among others. Now at this time, the black civil rights organizations were not focused on desegregation. They were focused on trying to provide more resources to black schools. The reason they did this is because courts had consistently ruled that racial segregation was legal, so they didn't think they had a legal foot to stand on. But in Mendes versus Westminster, they were challenging the very principle of segregation itself. The NAACP felt so strong about it that they sent Thurgood Marshall to help on the Mendes appeal. And ultimately, it was successful. The principle of segregation was ruled illegal because it denied Mexican children equal protection under the 14th Amendment. And this was the first major blow to legal segregation, and it led to the desegregation of California schools eventually. Of course, now they're resegregated for other reasons. But it also set the stage for Brown versus Board of Education. Robert Carter, an NAACP attorney, described Mendes, quote, as a dry run for the future. 
Thus, you can't fully understand Brown versus Board of Education without acknowledging Mendes. And you can't fully understand Mendes without acknowledging the NAACP, as well as the Japanese American Citizens League, American Jewish Congress, and other white allies. And this is what I mean when I talk about historical loops and co-imagining. Things are not so neat and tidy as one would appear they, uh, as, as they would appear to be. The NAACP didn't know what the outcome would be, but they had the foresight and commitment to get involved in a Mexican struggle. So to wrap this up, my goal has been just to complicate how we think about black and brown relations. I wanna be careful not to overstate histories and geographies of solidarity. I focus on these movements of political exchange because I think this is one of our best hopes for achieving racial justice. And I know that not all Latinxes and African-Americans want to struggle together, but I know that there is a minority who do and are willing to cross those lines. And that is what we need to support because that is how power is produced. And we desperately need that power to fight white supremacy as well as neoliberal capitalism. Um, thank you so much, Laura. When you think about that moment, what are some of the strategies or the, you know, or the things that happened during that moment um, in terms of coalition building that you thought stuck out? I was really struck with the centrality with which black people consistently reached out to all other kinds of people. You know, when we think about the formation of the Chicano, uh, of the Brown Berets, for example, in Los Angeles, um, the Black Panthers had just begun operating recently, and then there was a police killing in, um, in uh, you know, a barrio. And what they did is they came and they joined a candle lit light vigil. And based on that particular event then and that interaction, that's when the Brown Berets are born. The question that I wanted to follow up with is, you know, so much when we talk about um, race relations in the U.S., it, it boils down to, you know, black, white, racial binary. And then when we think about activism, it focuses uh, more on um, black, brown activism. But what are kind of, um, how do we, you know, you, you, how do we fit in, uh, not even just Asian Americans, but also, um, you know, Muslim Americans and Native Americans in these kind of like constellations of coalition and co-imagining? Have you seen, are there any moments where, you know, you've seen it really kind of stick out and pop that there's been that type of, uh, you know, multiracial beyond the black brown focus um, uh, solidarity and organizing? Well, I, I think the immigrant rights movement has a lot of possibilities, right? That has been because um, even though it is everyone, you know, we are the majority of immigrants, of course, as Latinx people, but it affects all kinds of people, right? Um, certainly um, uh, South Asians, Africans, uh, there is a whole black, um, is it black immigrant justice alliance in Oakland, right? Um, that works in partnership with many Latinx organizations. So I think immigrants is a really important one. I get concerned sometimes about like um, some of the work of the dreamers, not that I don't support the dreamers because I do, but um, it's not sufficiently, I think, um, that's a privileged position um, by focusing just on dreamers, right? In terms of they are like the good immigrants, right? And so uh, we, we need to do a lot of work. And I think that's something that we need to be really taking a leadership on to both highlight the diversity of immigration experiences um, as well as uh, challenging more, uh, you know, the good immigrant narrative. So uh, we have a question in the Zoom from, uh, you know, Elaine. And one of the things that they ask is, how can white organizing fit into this most multiracial struggle for racial equity? And so I'm asking that, you know, I'm even thinking that question just uh, personally makes me think of the young patriots that were in coalition with the young lords and the Black Panthers in terms of forming the first rainbow coalition. Um, you know, how have, how is your research, you know, which I know is focused on activism of color, um, but how is, uh, how is it kind of, how do you see, um, you know, that rad radical white activism fitting into some of these projects and, or organizing? These, in this particular moment, I think the most important white pe thing for white people to do is to organize other white people. Um, that, is, that is work that is not easy for people of color to do. Um, it's much more difficult for us to do that. And that's what we need white allies doing more than anything else is working with your white families, communities to push them um, to understand the nature of white supremacy. I think one of the things I wanna ask is kind of pointing to some of your other work, right? Which is your current work, which is uh, creating an atlas of foundational white supremacy. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? I'm very interested in, I'm a geographer. I'm very interested in place. And um, 
I did this book with um, Laura Barakoff and Winnie Chang called The People's Guide to LA. And it's, a, it's like a radical tour guide that documents sites of racial, class, gender, and environmental struggle in LA County's history and landscape. And as I was doing it, so we focused on just on everyday vernacular landscapes and like, what were the stories of power and struggle associated with this bridge or with this beach or whatever it is. And then as I was doing this, I realized, well, what are all the things that the state chooses to actually commemorate? And if we think about what the state chooses to commemorate, that's a way of um, articulating a particular framework of the evolution and the history of the United States. What do we value, right? And what are the stories that we tell with it? So I want to close out by once again thanking uh, Laura so much for being here. Uh, we appreciate it so much. So give her your emojis, your hand claps, your care emojis, your hearts, uh, all, all the reacts. Um, and thank you so much, Laura. Thank you. Thank you. Glad I was able to be here. <laughs> we are Take care, everyone. Thank you. Fight on. Yes. <laughs>
I didn't realize it then, but now looking back, I know what it, I think one of the things that really piqued my interest was the camaraderie that I seen among the brothers, the uh, canalismo, brothers coming together. That, it, it, that fascinated me. Not so much about the violence, no other, more so than just the togetherness that we had at that time. Uh, a lot of people join gangs as kids because not, you know, they, they say a lot of kids come from broken homes and what have you. That wasn't my case. Uh, I was fortunate enough to have two parents, uh, lived in Little Italy, father always worked. It was just that fascination, man, just the fascination of the grouping. Uh, but then after a while, shit got serious. Mm. And so uh, how did you come to like the street, and like what changed? How did you get into the street intervention and violent prevention work that you're doing right now? Well, at the age of 16, which was not, back in 1979, uh, I got ambushed. I was with a brother of mine, and uh, he wasn't my blood brother, he was a brother though. And he didn't want to come hang out with me because I was banging too much. And uh, I promised him I wouldn't do none of that if he came visit me. The day he came visit me, we got, you know, they seen me, they ambushed us on Springfield and Thomas, and uh, he ended up getting shot 13 times. He died uh, in my arms, squeezing my thumb, took his last breath. And I didn't have the right people around me at that time to help me navigate through what just happened. I didn't realize that I was traumatized, that my spirit was broken. Uh, the day we buried him, fortunately caught my case. I was tried as an adult. I was 16 years old, I was 35 years. Uh, and I was illiterate. I never enrolled in a high school before I got incarcerated. I didn't know how to read and write. Uh, or in the prison running into brothers that were convicts, uh, that you know, it was just a whole, again, another cultural shock for me. Uh, you know, I'm a young kid walking into a, to a prison, you know, and I'm thinking all kind of stuff. But what, what the ironic thing was that I met some real educated, real smart, militant-minded brothers that started educating me, helping me. Uh, it took a while because I was stubborn. I didn't want to hear it. Uh, but then after I educated myself and started studying about my culture, what it is to be Mexican and the social injustices that's taking place, my mind started changing, my mindset. You know, uh, in prison, a lot of people find religion and I respect that, but that wasn't my case. It was cultura, it was culture that helped heal me. And with that transition taking place in my mind, I started educating, I started meeting a lot of brothers, you know, Latinos and African Americans that were about organizing, about education, about, you know, empowering the people for all the right reasons, right? Uh, and that what led me to where I'm doing today uh, we even started an organization that we started in Stateville, because we was in Stateville Prison, called the Latino Cultural Change Coalition. And 20 years out later, after a lot of us got out, we incorporated, we had an office in, in Humble Park, where we uh, worked with ex-offenders. Damn, you know, it's, it's really weird, kind of like, because I've, you know, even just preparing this, I've like heard and researched like both of your stories and things like that, and it's like hearing them out, hearing them out loud you know, not just like through the screen, kind of it, it hit different, um, you know, and I'm thinking about, you know, even this idea of, of the, their narratives of kind of like what, you know, what uh, gang culture is, or how it's looked, uh, what its origins are, you know, and in doing research for this show, I stumbled across like so many things I don't think a lot of people would even know, right? Like some of the roots of gangs, like particularly even like white gangs, they were like social athletic clubs and like how certain black and Latino gang gangs, right, arose out of kind of necessity as protection against white people in certain moments. And Bennett, when we were talking on that call, I think one of the craziest shit, <laughs> the things that like that happened was like how swift you were able to talk about the way you've seen gang culture change during the decades. Well, uh, when you go back in the history, if you ever see the movie, uh, The Gangs of New York, that movie was based on a time prior to ending slavery. This was pre 1865 and it was focused on Irish gangs. That they had a relationship with the politicians then through Tiffany Hall. And the Irish gangs uh, played a role with helping the politicians get votes. And a lot of that still happens today, you know. And so when you come into the early 1900s in Chicago, uh, blacks was relegated to like what you call the black belt. Today is known as Bronzeville, you know, in the, like in the 20s. <clears throat> And blacks were trying to cross Wentworth to the stockyard and get jobs and try to get housing because they were outgrowing that era between 27th Street South, I mean North, and 42nd Street South and Wentworth in the lake. And so they were outgrowing that. 
and they would run into a lot of confrontation with mainly the Irish gangs. And if you remember the 1919 race riot, uh, the Irish gangs played a dominant role in that. Uh, one large Irish gang was the Reagan Coats. Uh, this was Frank Reagan, who was the county commissioner, and that was the name of this Irish gang, the Reagan Coats. So the Irish was able to move into politics by open up what you call these social athletic clubs, where they would use the Irish street thugs to attack blacks, attack Mexicans, attack Italians, right? When them Irish guys turned 19, 20, they would get filtered into the police department, the fire department, or some type of city jobs, and you see that presence right today. So now when you go on into like the 30s, the great migration of the blacks from the south to the north coming to Chicago, the tension even got a little worse. You first start seeing a recording of black street gangs somewhere in the mid 40s, because they start penetrating the, the juvenile courts and going into IYC, the Illinois Youth Commission, like juvenile prison. And that's when you start seeing blacks banding together, fighting mainly those white gangs that ran the juvenile facilities. You know, the Italian gangs, the Jewish gangs, the Irish gangs. So they were dominating those juvenile facilities. So blacks band together to protect themselves. And out of that, they formed gangs behind the wall in the youth. Community. And when they hit the streets, they carried it on. As a matter of fact, in 1957, Pepelo dealt with Pepelo Perry. He found himself in IYC St. Charles, and he formed the Vice Lords in St. Charles. Going into the 60s, these movements, you know, you saw the civil rights movement, but the street gang more attracted to the black power movement. The, the, the Vice Lords saw themselves coming into their 20s, and they decided they want to do something for the younger youth in the Londia area, and they, believe it or not, met with the two police commanders in Londia, the 10th and 11th District Police Commanders, and appealed to them that they were older, they were vice lords, they want to do something different. So those two police officers, believe it or not, helped them organize a conference where the vice lords united with their opposition, the Egyptian Copas and the Roman Saints, and collectively they pulled off a conference with the support of the two police commanders. So that formed a citywide coalition among the three major black street gangs, and they called it LSD, Lord Stones and Disciples. And, and, and it was at that time, you only had maybe 25 gang intelligence police officers, but then Daly saw that the black street gangs had the same potential as the Irish gangs in the 30s and the 40s to come into some power. But now these black street gangs were voting, they was putting people in office in their community that they felt would better represent them. They were challenging uh, construction. They were challenging uh, different conditions, right? And they saw this unity. So Daly called it a war on street gangs. I got newspaper clippings showing how they, the, the street gangs came together, shut down the rioting, and, and gave support to those that were victims of rioting, right? But you don't hear that in the news, and you don't read a lot of that in some of the books. Right? And so now you saw a trend from black street gangs coming. And then, not to mention, the Black Panthers came with the Young Patriot, which was a white a group on the north side, and then the Young Lords, which were a Hispanic group on the north side. And they formed the first Rainbow Coalition. Jesse Jackson didn't come up with that. It was Fred Hampton that united with uh, uh, the Cha Cha, -Cha Hernandez of the Young Lords and the Young Patriots. It was a 1966 riot where the Hispanics were saying, no more, we need to be heard too, right? And so now uh, the, the, the leaders of the 60s, Malcolm X assassinated, Martin Luther King assassinated, Fred Hampton assassinated, Mecca Evers, Bobby Gore spoke before the Vice Lords during time in prison, Sengali spoke before the Stone, got convicted, uh, uh, charged with a murder, right? So you saw this going on. And so now the leadership went behind the wall. My generation, we were coming out of the Youth Commission in 70, 71, right? And we got pulled into a new culture. When I left in 69, black people was wearing afros, dashiki, talking about power to the people. But when I came out of St. Charles in 71, people cut their afros off, man. They got permanent hairdos, got rid of their dashiki, got tailor-made clothes on. 
Jim Brown is not in the show anymore talking about power to the people. You got Superfly and the Mac. So that was a culture shift. So now in the late 70s, early 80s, a lot of uh, street game members were coming out, right? But before that, you can't forget all the rioting that was going on behind the wall. Not just in Illinois, but nationwide, the Attica riot, right. Eastville riot. I got caught up in the 1978 Pontiac riot when they indicted me and 16 other gang leaders, me, Larry Hoover. He was all charged with 15 counts of murder, two attempt murder, mob action. Right? Even when the state admitted that they were expecting that riot a year before it happened because Pontiac was designed to house 600 inmates, but on the day of the riot, it was over 2,000 inmates, right? And so coming from under that in 1981, when we got acquitted, when I hit the street, it was like, you know, like a shock, a culture shock to me. Because now you start seeing street gangs dabbing into drugs, dabbing into the drugs, whereas prior to that, we would run drug dealers out the neighborhood, right? Prostitutes wow. out the neighborhood. So in the 80s, you had New Jack City. Everybody wanted to be Nino Brown, man. <laughs> right? And then in the 90s, Scarface hit the scene. Now everybody wanted to be a gangster. And then you start seeing a splinter. And law enforcement changed how they would address street gangs. Now they wasn't calling them gangs, they labeled them organized crime. State cases now became federal cases because it was gang attached to it. And that's what happened. And that's what you see today. Uh, the displintering of these street organizations today look clicks because of that breakup of the hierarchy, even in the prison where it was all developed. Now, two or three inmates can't be congregated together. One of them might get transferred. Just to break that up, you know, and you start seeing it on the streets also. Damn, that is like, we just got like a gangster's history of the United States of America right now, right? I, you know, after we talked, Bennett, one of the things that I uh, said, you know, that, that I threw out to, um, you know, my, my friends on Facebook was like, yo, like, someone needs to write a book that tells the U.S. history, but through the perspective of, of gang members on the street and that were, you know, incarcerated as well, because you can see certain things, right? Like you could see, um, you know, the way the Black Power Movement inflected it or the way, you know, in the Brown Berets, I'm sure as well, right, Max? Like, and like, um, also like, you know, the way when they started abandoning, government started abandoning communities and drugs, right? Deployed crack and things like that. You could see how it kind of like, what it would look like from narrating it from that position. Max, you know, I'm wondering like, I think about, you know, you, uh, it, you know, it's been d d decades now since you were kind of first in a gang. How have you seen Latino gangs change, you know, on your end from when you were involved? Um, it changed in a lot of ways, man. Um, for sure, the number has grown and it almost seems as, as as, as the number has grown, uh, the lack of uh, structure has faded away. Um, and it, because like Brother Benny was saying, a lot of the leaderships started getting incarcerated. And when that started happening, at least within the Latinos, uh, a lot of brothers started falling away from tradition, what it was, you know, what was the purpose of all this from the beginning. Uh, before I got incarcerated in 79, you know, cocaine and all that, that wasn't in our hood. That wasn't, you know, the cocaine was, with all due respect, was a white man's high. Mm -hmm. and, and her around was for them brothers coming from Vietnam that was going through those stuff. So I, we didn't, drugs were that, that, that uh, uh, it wasn't a problem on the streets for us at that time in 79. Uh, so, so therefore at that time, the Latinos that, that were involved, that were all together, like in the Humble Park area, uh, the South Side, we were more together um, for the, for, for, I will say for the right reasons until gunplay got involved. Uh, we're trying to protect the neighborhood, uh, making sure that, uh, you know, our sisters weren't being stuck up, persons being snatched or raped or whatever. But it seems as if we got bigger in number and we felt that, that studio power and the stronger we became, the strong, the, the, uh, we felt that, hey man, we're ready to fight anybody. As opposed to directing that energy into something positive, like Brother Benny was explaining the movements that was taking place in the 60s and early 70s. Uh, I wish we would have been around at that era in that capacity in which we was. Things might have been different today. I wish I'd have been able to help contribute, right, in a positive way, that movement, as he said it was, which it was a movement. What we was left with, though, to deal with, 
was a lot of the gang bang, especially among the Latinos, because in the early seven, in the early eighties, majority of every Latino that was incarcerated, we were there for killing each other for murder, unfortunately, right? Uh, but when we started educating ourselves and started really acknowledging the potential that we really have, not just as a gang, but as a pe as a people, uh, we was already behind the wall with it. So we started reaching out to our communities, to the brothers in the neighborhood, and try to preach this, this, this thing of unity, of Latinismo, brothers coming together, man. Uh, we even started to understand the political system. You know, we knew that numbers was important and that we had the numbers, uh, but our agenda was fucked up, man. We, we weren't seeing clearly because we was like, just trying to get our two feet on uh, solid ground to help our brothers progress. Not so much in the, in the criminal life and stuff like that, but as a people, we was really stuck on culture, man. Culture was 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 uh, something that you must know, you know. And when you know who you are, as my as one of our brothers named Booney always says, if, if you love who you are, how can you hurt somebody that looks like you, right? And that's what you know. And so our education and our organizing was more based on unifying each other and doing programs, educating brothers. And then, then, like Brother Benny was saying, a lot of the African American brothers in the prison system were organizing, and, and were were changing the dynamics of gangs. Like we didn't want to be a gang member no more; we wanted to be nation. It was different. Uh, it gave a sense of purpose and identity, right? On top of us being Latinos or what have you. When I got out of prison, I got locked up in '79 and got out in '96. When I got out, I was so. Um, I was in a culture shock again. And I said, damn, what the fuck happened out here? What do we do, man? It was so nuts that, uh, I, I, you know, brothers that would come visit us and we would talk about unity, about organizing, about politicalizing. When I got out there, there was nothing that we talked about. It was just a lot of chaos, chaos on top of chaos. It wasn't even organized chaos. It was just fucking chaos, man. I got shot. I got out in 96 and in 99, I got shot trying to mediate some problems between Western and Dickens, you know, uh, and some of my old homies, because I was out here talking about peace and unity, my other homies that were still stuck with that, you know, try to use it as a, man, let's get these fools now. Now was that time. I go, no, 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 no. I'm going to take this bullet, goddammit, for as a bridge of communication so we can talk, brother, because this is not going to solve nothing. We've been doing this shit since the 70s, 69. All the way to 79, 80s, and 90s, we've been killing each other. This shit don't work, man. All we do is become our own genocide. So a lot of my personal buddies got upset at me because uh, I could have easily, you know, suggested, hey, man, let's take these dudes down. But I didn't. That wasn't my talk. My, that wasn't my preaching. My preaching was unity, man. Because uh, I wasn't the target, per se. Uh, and then when the people who did shoot me realized that they had shot me, they, you know, they were sending messages, we're sorry, it was this, it was that. And I said, look, let's just communicate, man. So uh, again, coming out of prison, you know, seeing the, the changes that have taken place among the Latinos, man, uh, it, it kind of hurted me a lot, man, because uh, I knew we were better than that. We had better potential to organize. And we still do, it's not too late. It's not too late at all. You know, shit's gonna happen. There's nothing that we can do there's not a magic wand that we can wave that's going to stop the gang violence. It's been here since the 1800s. And unfortunately, it's going to outlive each and one of us on this damn Zoom thing right here. And that's just the reality of it. But that don't mean that we give up, brother. What right. it means is that we really got to step up, not give up, step up. And with brothers like Benny and other brothers I've been blessed to rub shoulders with and embrace and work with, uh, I see this. I see the hope, man. It's just, you know, there is no one fixed solution, man. There's no one. Every, every individual is different. Every mob is different. Every block is different. So, uh, but nevertheless, I believe that despite the change and the breakdown in the structure and all that, I still see hope. What I, what I was actually thinking about too is this idea of like, we have, you know, when we talk about like gangs being political, we always go to the young lords joining the Black Panthers, right? And I think part of that is because it, it, it really fits into our, uh, it's, re it's documented, right? And then it also really fits into our history of what a revolution looks like, right? And 
uh, and it's a kind of a kind of of, of, um, of how we imagine a revolution and social organization looks like. But what's crazy about the shit that you guys are talking about is like this also was revolutionary shit, right? And 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 it's kind of and it wasn't you know necessarily started by activists, right? It was started by people that are forgotten in in a lot of ways or kind of just you know and, and criminalizing and you know and gang members and things like that. And so to me, like. What does like non-respectable revolution look like, right? That's coming out of these spaces. I think is like, um, it's it's fucking crazy. It's not even a, an idea that I thought about. One of the things I, I do want to do right now, because we're running out of time, is pivot. And Max, I just want to really quick, because I think you know, there's that documentary that came out, Violence Interrupters, about you know, ten years ago now almost. And um, and I still think that people really don't understand like uh, street intervention, right? But I know that that um, street intervention is really important. Last week when shit popped off. And so what, um, you know, can you talk to us a little about like, what is, what are the philosophies and objectives of street interventionist work? Well, I'll tell you what the philosophy is, what it means to me as a street intervention specialist. People get involved in social justice, especially brothers that have been involved on the streets because we're tired of our self-destruction taking place. We understand these little brothers and sisters. They're our kids. They don't come from Pluto, some fucking where else. They come from our home. These are our kids. Uh, to and so I think that the, the brothers that 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 got that gets involved with street intervention that had you know that were from the streets that told me that those are the only people that can help street involved people with people that was involved now that's not what I'm saying but I think that the brothers that that eventually got involved with street intervention in the city of Chicago uh, really helped make that effective because kids want to be understood. A lot of times people, adults, don't understand us. And majority of our kids, every majority of those adults that have been in their life have let them down. So that's a factor that a lot of people don't talk about. So kids don't trust adults. They don't trust, they trust their own peers, man. And and we were their peers, we're just grown. We're educated, we become men. And when we connect, you know, we always say in, in, in street intervention that we're only effective as they are receptive. And how do we make these little brothers and sisters receptive? Well, we got to be genuine. Uh, we got to be empathetic. We got to understand. Uh, don't judge. Uh, and be there. And literally fucking be there. I get calls one, two, three in the morning on Fridays and Saturdays. You can't say, hey, the office is closed. I'll holler at you. Stay safe. <laughs> like that. You got to go out there, man, because mm-hmm. you'll, lose, you'll, you'll lose whatever you've established. Because these kids, sometimes we're the only one they got. So uh, this is this is one of the things that a lot of people think that the only one that can mentor an African American or a Latino is an African American or a Latino. That's not true, man. That's not necessarily true. Would it help to have the experiences? Of course. But do, is it necessary to have this experience to be effective in somebody's life? No, sir. All you got to do is have the ganas. Is love your people, man. Ganas. That's it. They got to have those ganas, man, and, and have a, a organized network system set up of resources. Because once the good talk and the connection and everything is made and we're helping these, you're going to realize just how many social needs they have. Not just the kid, the family as well. And we have to have a whole set of resources ready to tell this family, okay, this, this agency can help you. This referral can help you get here or whatever it is. What would you say, like... And I also want to tease out what happened last week, you know, all of that kind of stuff and kind of clarify some misconceptions. But what I would say is like, I think it's like what people can do, right? Like, and what, you know, and, and if, and, or is there shit that people can do, right? Because I also know, you know, Benny, even just thinking about some of the stuff that formerly incarcerated people go through and trying to rebuild their lives, which is exactly one of the things that motivated your organization, right? So what are the ways that like people can help your work, um, you know, directly? Or what are the ways that, um, you know, that, that other ways that people can follow your work um, or do any of that stuff. Hmm. Time is one thing, but doing the work with the person coming out of prison is another thing, hmm. right? One of our biggest struggles is that one, we all form the cost convicted people. I mean, we got backgrounds. You know, you got these larger organizations that got a history, you know, these are what I call the usual suspects. They the one that's getting the grants every year. Hmm. So it's hard for us to compete with them. They got these savvy grant writers. They established a history of managing grants, but we're trying to develop that history. So we get shunned a lot. So people can get behind us if they they know people in places that uh, uh, grant the grants, (laughs) right? That review the grants, right? 
we start like we, we met with a uh, state rep Deshaun Ford and Camille Lilly and they're pushing that some of the monies that's coming down in Illinois go directly to some of the grassroots organizations. Stop giving it to these large How it should be. How it should be. According to your question about what is it that people can do, people that are interested, especially teachers, counselors, people that are engaged with you, they need to enroll in some kind of trauma informed care. Because like I said, these kids are traumatized, man. And if we don't understand what trauma informed care means and how trauma behave, uh, uh, affects behavior, we will only see the surface of the kid and not inside of him or her. Uh, being, being, uh, uh, being effective is understanding like a doctor. You gotta know what the disease is. You gotta know that disease, man, how, how it affects the body. And, uh, and that's what we, and that's what people gotta do that wants to get involved in this field, man. Learn about trauma-informed care. And like Benny Lee said, man, you gotta be real, man. You gotta wanna help kids to get into this field. Um, I mean, there's, 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 you know, and then there's always a flip side to this. I had kids that I helped end up getting killed after I helped them. And, and, it, and it imbalanced me. I felt like, damn, I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. How the fuck, I let this kid get killed. But, you know, and that's out of guilt, you know? But when, when we allow guilt to enter our mainstream of the work that we do, we become real and effective. We even not, you know, well, for a moment, like me, I, I stopped believing that what I was doing, I was in the wrong field. I said, this, this is not what I'm supposed to do. Because when this one kid got killed, I got him out the gang, got his tattoos removed off his face. And then like six months later, his mother called me two, three in the morning, brought yeah. me up crying. I didn't even, know, I didn't even know who she was. I couldn't understand her. And when I got to the hospital, he had already passed. Uh, May he rest in peace. And that tilt my scale, man. Uh, like I said, you know what? I ain't shit. You know, this work that you're talking about, you're doing, it ain't shit, man. You're not doing nothing, man. I just couldn't save this kid. So I was beating myself down because I got involved with this brother because I seen all his potential, his change, his transformation. And then they snuffed him out, you know, took his life. Uh, and I was uh, not sure that if what I was doing was the right thing. Uh, when I go to think and stuff, I haven't done it lately, but when I really go, I go to the cemetery. And that time I spent like a damn near a week in that cemetery just thinking and thinking about it. And it, caught, and it came to the realization, I did help this little brother. He did, he was on his way of doing the right things in his life. But this is just, this is just some of the things that come with this right. field that we gotta understand that um, you gotta have a psychological distance, man. Thank you all so much for being here. I fucking like, don't even know you all, but I love you all. And I appreciate the shit that you guys are doing. Thanks so much. Thank you. Later, man. Thank you, Lee, love you, brother. Love you too, <laughs> So I wanted to uh, start off by uh, thanking everyone for tuning into the Hoodwazi's first teaching series. I want to thank uh, Gao, our technical director, for uh, handling the series, being able to live stream it and handling all of that. Um, I also want to thank uh, Yasmin Mikhail, uh, our editorial and event producer who helped put this whole thing together. Uh, and I want to thank especially our lecturing professors, Paul Ortiz, Roger Garcia Peña, Josie Saldana, uh, Laura Pulido, and uh, Bennett Lee and Max Serda. Uh, this is the first time we try to do one of these teaching series and the response we have got since we announced it has been overwhelming. So as most of you know, the series was designed in response to the eruption of black and brown racial tensions and brown on black violence that occurred in predominantly Mexican neighborhoods on the south and southwest sides of Chicago during the protests for George Floyd. And the focus of these lectures was meant to provide information and understanding about the uh, deep dynamics and history of black brown relations uh, including conflict and moments of solidarity, as well as insight into other factors uh, that uh, played into what happened last week, like uh, the racial formation of Mexicans or uh, history and realities of gangs in Chicago. And the idea is that this knowledge will not just uh, help inform and transform your life, but also help you to inform and transform the lives of others to have radiant effect in your communities. Along those lines, this closing session that I'm delivering is meant to provide knowledge you can use in engaging critiques of protests and riots by arming you with concepts and ideas around such expressions uh, of resistance and by examining the logics and rhetoric in which these critiques of protests are rooted. And it's so important that we do have those conversations right now because right now there are people 
with righteous rage and they are expressing it through protests, through riots and through the one word that nobody can get out of their fucking mouths, looting. And it's so important we engage those critiques of protests because critiques of protests are meant to delegitimize protests and police how people protest. And that actually only helps the state, dominant culture, dominant media, and the actually and the actual police who are trying to eradicate resistance and rebellion like protests and riots. So this lecture is grounded in the fundamental assertion that any time spent critiquing protests or protesters for how they protest, particularly black people, rather than supporting protest efforts and focusing on the issue of police brutality, particularly against black people, is aiding and abetting a, a white supremacy, police brutality, and capitalism. And the session is about uh, dismantling critiques of protest, and it was titled Hacking Logics and Rhetorics. And that's not a title I picked just because it sounds cool as fuck, although it does, but because words mean things. And I want to use the words in this title to guide this talk, and I'd like to start by discussing the word hacking. So hacking has a few meanings. Uh, one of the most meanings we know, the, the, one of the older meanings we know is like through uh, slang, right? It refers to the ability to manage as in you can't hack it. Um, or it can also mean to cut through stuff with rough blows, like hacking your way through a jungle with a machete. And both of those are probably applicable, especially the latter. But the significance of hacking that I'm really relying on in this talk is how it is most understood today in reference to computers, where it means gaining unauthorized access to data in a system. So I'll repeat that, gaining unauthorized access to data in a system. So you can uh, sit with that. And I'm sure you're probably wondering how the fuck is this relevant, <laughs> right? Like we're talking about critiques of protests, not the matrix. Why are we talking on hack about hacking? But I wanna tell you when we're talking about critiques of protests, we're also talking about the matrix. And I'm referring to the matrix of power in which we live in. And it's within that matrix that not only resistance rises, but the critiques of protests arise to combat that resistance, to counter it. And I'm not being metaphorical when I say the term matrix, and I would not be the first person to use that term earnestly as an assessment of the society in which we live. I do think it's useful that we think of us as living in a matrix of power. Uh, and that matrix is, I guess we can say a container, a system, or a container of systems and orders that are operating at once, like white supremacy, capitalism, heteropatriarchy, et cetera. And like the matrix in the movie, right? The one we're living in is just as interested in maintaining and reproducing its power. So I guess then the question that I wanna throw out is how does power or this matrix of power that we're in sustain and perpetuate itself? And how does this matrix of power absorb or deal with challenges or threats to its dominance um, or to its power, th threats to its power like resistance, like protests. Well, there's many ways, right? And we see them, like the brute force we see right now with police violently attacking protesters. But part of how power uh, most successfully sustains and perpetuates itself is to enlist us in that project, to get us to help it out, uh, to help, out, uh, help it out maintain relationships of, do of domination, relationships of power. And so to tease this a little bit out, I wanna introduce two terms that are relevant ideology and discourse. And we're gonna go ahead and talk about those for a little bit. Uh, so very quickly, I wanna define these terms as quickly as possible <laughs> um, and discuss how they're deployed on us by this matrix that we're living in, uh, by the US state, right? So a shorthand definition of ideology might be a system or beliefs, a system of beliefs um, or a set of ideas that both constitute uh, our worldview, how we see things, and also work to uphold particular uh, power dynamics. So again, ideology is a system of beliefs. It's a set of ideas. Uh, they uh, end up shaping our view, um, and they also uphold power dynamics. So we can see this uh, all over the US, right? One of the uh, major ideologies around this country is the idea that this is a meritocratic country where anyone can work as uh, you know, hard as they can and if they work as hard as they can, they can be anything they wanna be, right? And that they can pull themselves up by their bootstraps. This is a perfect example of ideology because you know many people adapt that view, right? You just gotta work hard enough, but we know it's not true, right? Enslaved people, enslaved, kidnapped indigenous Africans and, and their descendants worked very hard and were not, to, were not able to exceed uh, enslaved status because of the, the, the power structure that was in place, you know, unless they protested, 
right? Or ran off the plantation. Essential workers right now are working, working very hard during this pandemic and are not being compensated for their labor under life risking conditions, right? But Jeff Bezos can kind of like chill in his crib, doesn't even have to work and is making still, be still became a trillionaire during COVID-19. So, but we can think about, right? When we think about how it, how it upholds power, uh, this ideological current, the bootstraps mentality, the work, all you gotta do is work hard, makes it possible to perpetuate power and domination, at least on a few levels. For one, the people that subscribe to it, they'll rush into regimes of wage labor, they'll become enlisted in capitalist productivity, right? Grind culture and all the time that they're working, they're actually generating profits for the companies that they work for, work for. when they're under exploited labor conditions or just like, man, maybe I gotta stick with this, right? Uh, I, I gotta work hard. Um, that's an example. Another level, um, this ideology, that, that this ideology works to sustain power is it conceals the very inequality, right? It conceals the very inequality that the system uh, produces. Right? And we see this, we see this with this ideology. So when we see uh, poverty, when we see poor people, we don't see systemic inequality, right? So many people just see people who didn't work hard enough. They're just lazy. They're there because of their own moral failings. And then another level that this uh, that, that we can see how ideology sustains power dynamics is when people themselves internalize the ideology, right? So this an example in the world that I'm using right now would be an impoverished uh, the impoverished people themselves that internalize these ideas and view their poverty as a result of their own moral and personal failings, as opposed to manufactured scarcity and you know capitalism and a neoliberal. Um, nation state that's administering violence, including, you know, the conditions in which they live in. So this is an example of ideology. And this example that I'm using is actually central to classism, which coincidentally is also at the heart of a lot of protests, uh, critiques of protests, if you think about it. So how often have you heard, you know, over the years when protesters shut down an expressway or street, uh, something to the effect of, you know, someone will say like, oh, why are they doing that? Why don't they just get a job instead of making it hard for people? You know, we're just trying to get to work, right? So if you think about the logic that is underpinning, you know, that critique of protest, it's actually, you know, a classist logic that's completely related to some of this ideology, right? It's here in this kind of critique, protesters are just being reduced to individuals who are complaining, they're lazy, right? They're, um, they're uh, saboteurs that just have nothing better to do. Right, as opposed to, you know, resisting injustice. And uh, critiques of looting are also seated in this ideology, right? Looters are often described as opportunistic. I want you to type in looters and opportunistic in Google or in Twitter or in your Facebook search and watch the amount of times those words are being used together. And the idea is that, you know, the looters are opportunistic, they don't wanna work, right? They just want to, um, they don't wanna get what they want the right way, so they're capitalizing off of social unrest to steal. But in these instances, the state, police, or media, they don't have to even do anything to delegitimize, discredit um, police or squash protests, right? Because this ideology and the people that subscribe to these ideological kind of linchpins, they're doing it. Uh, they do it in their minds and they do it with their engagements with others. Uh, you know, when they critique protests on social media, uh, when they critique them with their, you know, with their family members. So that's an example of uh, ideology at work during this pandemic and during these protests. Um, another example that we can even think about when we think about ideology at work during this pandem pandemic is the way white nationalists and white people, seemingly mostly working class, seemingly kind of more rural, um, across the country arm themselves to militia and they storm state capitals because they didn't want to be told they had to stay home or wear face masks. And, you know, really this seems kind of like a novel thing, but it's actually not. We shouldn't be surprised by this because really what they're operating on is an ideology that the U.S. has peddled since its, found, since, since its founding. And that is the ideology that the U.S. is a country of independence, individualism, and freedom. And, you know, here freedom is marked or measured by the ability to have individual choice, not collective responsibility. So that's kind of ideology. Let's keep that in our mind. And then I want to discuss discourse. Now, a lot of times when we talk about discourse in just kind of a casual everyday way, we think of it as conversation or maybe more complexly, we think about it as the conversation, right? So we might say something like, activists have pushed the mainstream discourse on policing from reform to defunding police, or they've pushed it from reform to even abolition, 
But even if we consider how this discourse was shifted, it was not just through conversation, but through all sorts of speech, right? Verbal speech, written speech, and also many other things, images and semiotics, right? So like memes um, and also knowledge production, right? The amount of studies that, um, and kind of like critical essays and, and research that's come out to uh, propose alternatives to policing, or even the books of, you know, a great abolitionist thinker like Ruth Wilson Gilmore, all of that kind of um, counts, right, in discourse. And so in cultural studies, or for someone like Foucault, discourse is not just a conversation or the conversation, but it's really also everything that produces the conversation. It's the product and production of knowledge and meaning uh, within social systems uh, or, you know, and within a historical moment. And one of the things that's really important to remember is that discourse is always related to power. I think we can really see how power uses discourse when we examine how it was how it deployed discourse, how did power dis deploy discourse to corroborate enslaving people. Articulating this idea that African people were worthy of enslavement was reliant on discourse. Right? It was reliant on the physical, uh, philosophical writings of someone like Hegel saying that Africa was completely continent, void of civilization, and indigenous Africans were just savages running around. It also included religious perspectives that said Africans were the children of God, were the ch I'm sorry, were the children of Ham and they had no God and were in need of a Christian intervention. It was reliant on explorers' accounts of Africans as uncivilized primitives dancing around statues, or you know, they would present drawings of Africans that depicted them in uh, subhuman bestial ways. And this racist discourse would motivate more discursive production, right? And eventually you would have science that was creating discourse, making truth claims and producing knowledge through absurd, you know, dehumanizing studies that included measuring black people's heads to prove that they weren't really, you know, actually human. Um, and then this would, you know, eventually beget more discourses like the inscription of laws um, that ensured black people would be uh, slaves in perpetuity, right? The miscegenation laws, one drop laws, um, and all that kind of uh, took the slave uh, status and made it inheritable. And it also concretized, um, it also shows how discourse concretizes and contributes to, um, you know, uh, uh, you know anti-blackness and anti-slavery. Anti you can look at the status of any subjugated group in the country or world, I would argue, and track how they've been in part relegated to that marginal status through discourse. And you could examine the historical contemporary discourse that helps keep them, there, right? So when we look at immigrants, them going from stealing jobs, um, you know, which is something that's always been there to in a post 9-11 world when someone like Trump is saying that immigrant, he uses the fear of the, of the discourse around terrorism and then applies it from, you know, transposes it from Muslim bodies onto Mexican bodies and says, you know, Mexicans are akin to terrorism. They're, in, they're infesting, they're dangerous, they're criminals, they're rapists. So what I wanna make uh, clear that I hope this is making clear is how discourse shapes the world and it doesn't just determine the world, it over determines the world. Because part of what discourse does is shape consciousness. And it shapes the consciousness, not just of individuals, but also at the level of culture or population. It contours it, it works to outline horizons of conceptualizations, and it frames what we see and informs how we see it. And I think what's important to understand in, mold, in this molding of our consciousness or conceptual horizons or frames is that it's endurance, right? It lasts. So consider this, right? One of the ways that Europeans discussed Africans wasn't just as animals or subhuman, but even as demonic. In fact, there are, you know, drawings of Africans that Europeans made where they were depicted with demonic faces, fiery eyes, and rows of fang teeth. And I want to consider us how hundreds of years later, Hillary Clinton referred to black youth as super predators, right? This idea of a monster, of, a, of something demonic. Um, and I want everyone to, uh, you know, when you get a minute, to look up the transcript of Darren Wilson's testimony explaining why he had to shoot Mike Brown. And you will see that he says in that testimony, I think a, I think a few times, he looked like a demon. He says, oh, you know, he just looked like a demon, right? And so it's kind of crazy because it's almost the inheritance, right? Of this discourse of a logic that was articulated through discourse that black people are this demonic other. And so, you know, in these instances, we see old wine filling new bottles. So this points out another um, element of ideology and discourse and that part of it is not just about shaping the dominated subjectivity, right? But in shaping the dominated subjectivity, you actually get to carve out and outline what the privileged subject looks like, what the privileged person looks like. 
right? So telling you what you are gets to tell me what I'm not might be a very kind of um, layman way of talking about it. So I wanted to tease this out because I really want to show how ideology and discourse upholds power. And I think it's important because we know that ideologies and discourses can be classist, right? Like the one that I use, the bootstrap mentality, but also they can be racist, right? Like the example that I used about, um, you know, around discourse that uh, help perpetuate slavery. They could be sexist, ableist, ageist, adultist, homo and transphobic, Islamo and xenophobic. And all those kind of discourses were crafted. They were created. And they were precisely created to outline, right, the privilege and the power that the straight, cis, wealthy, white, able-bodied, you know, male uh, can assume. Um, and so a lot of these ideologies, we actually do see them, uh, and a lot of this discourse, we, discourse we actually see converge in critiques of uh, protests, riot, riots, or looting, and other expressions of discontent. So I used the example earlier of how even some of the critique of protests um, uh, how classism is embedded with uh, the critiques of protests and, and, and classist discourse like looting. But also in those critiques of looting and condemnations uh, of uh, looters is racism, right? So for instance, when we think how looters are discussed, looters are discussed as just opportunistic or senseless aggress aggressors. But this actually recalls and is rooted in stereotypes of black people that they are criminal and violent or even older stereotypes that they're animalistic, uh, savage subhumans, they're incapable of rational thought, right? They actually um, cannot control themselves, um, you know, or it's also even more kind of other contemporary uh, uh, racial stereotypes that black people play the race card, right? They're always trying to use racial oppression to get over on the system, trying to cheat the system, like the racist, sexist stereotype of the uh, welfare woman, the welfare mother. Um, you know, and even thinking about, again, how multiple discourses or, or logics, uh, uh, you know, oppressive logics can converge. So even when we think about youth, they actually are not just necessarily carefree. Some of the most important social movements in this country have been motivated by youth, right? Student movements that help propel the anti-Vietnam War um, or civil rights, um, you know, or aided civil rights movements. Um, also, you know, most recently we had, uh, you know, all the young people that were protesting and, and, and you know, and rallying around gun control. Um, so youth have been a uh, historically a major force of protest, but right a lot of discourse also frequently frames them as immature. They're petulant and they're re they're, they're, re they're rebellious, but it's actually needlessly. It's just kind of them growing up, um, and that they're destructive, right? And this is often how protests are discussed, right? So we can see how critiques of protests also draw from adultist or paternalist discourse and, and ideologies. Uh, I hope it's necessary to see why I spend so much time teasing out ideology and discourse because I want to highlight. Uh, much of the critiques of protests that we're seeing, they have a history, right? Or Foucault would say they have a genealogy that you could actually, you know, track the very, the even way, like the way that we're thinking, you can actually track it, right? Um, and that they draw from and are informed and shaped by pre-existent ideologies and discourse. So the critiques we're seeing today, they're kind of mutations or they draw from existent, uh, pre-existent critiques. And part of why I'm discussing any of this is because I want us to clearly understand whether it's critiques of protests or understanding and contesting any other injustice that's administered, we must really understand what the condition of possibility for it is. How is it possible? How is it possible to lock up one third of black men? How is it possible to separate families, right? And we actually can, can see that that's not the first time the US has, has done that, right? So. Black people were confined when they were confined to a plantation. They were confined when they were confined during segregation to, you know, black spaces, right? Or, you know, in a, in a negative way, not like black, own, you know, black owned spaces. We can look at that when we think about immigration, right? How is it possible to break up families, to, to put them in, in, in concentration camps? How is it possible to assimilate them into the prison industrial complex? Well, the way we talk about immigrants as brown people from beyond the border of civilization, they're savages and they're threatening proper society, proper civilization is exactly how natives were talked about, right? As savages, as red savages from beyond the borders of civilization that are threatening proper, proper civilization, right? And so we see that there's a continuity in the logics, right? And in the rhetorics that are being played out um, that's kind of shaped by and, and sh shaped by ideologies and discourse. So remember I discussed the meaning of hacking and I said that it's a unauthorized access to data of a system. And I say that because so much of power works is by using tools like ideology and discourse to program us, 
and this programming becomes second nature, or we might say naturalized. So that the programming seems like it's of us, and the critiques that people make against resistance when they shit on it, right? The critiques of protest, they seem self-evident, right? It seems obvious. Uh, it seems like this is just what everyone should be thinking. And many people do think it, but that's not because they're thinking, right? That's not their independent thought or critical thought. It's because what they're thinking is downloaded thought, right? It's actually hijacking it, uh, critical independent thinking. Remember how I discussed the uh, ideology that includes the bootstrap mentality or the idea and belief that as long as you work hard, you can be anything you want. Well, that ideology, right, it's very much a way to enshrine something like private property because it means that something like private property, you know, and the, and the person that owns it, the ability to own something is actually a marker of hard work, right? That that private property, someone worked for it and that's their hard work. Well, we know that there's been uh, so many laws that have been relegating people from ownership, right? Something like home ownership for black people has had so many obstacles in its way from a systemic level. And so that the lack, the, the idea that, that, that uh, black people have, you know, low home ownership is completely a product of power. Actually, the attainment of private property is not always about hard work, right? Oftentimes it's something like whiteness, right? Which is often treated as a property. It's something that's, a, and, and both of them, right? Are something that can often be inherited and that are actually manufactured. We saw even this, these ideas around private property, right? This enshrinement of private, private property, this, this idea of, of, of uh, even luxury, right? Play out in critiques of the protests and riots downtown, and once again with looting. And people who are indoctrinated by this, by this kind of ideology, they were upset that a Macy's or a Gucci or a Target or a Nike or an Apple was getting its windows busted, uh, you know, more than they were about the hundreds of people uh, and ongoing murders of black people that incited, uh, you know, by police that incited a mobilization for protesters to go downtown in the first place. And suddenly these people are spending more time condemning people for stealing purses or whatever mass produced products than they are condemning police for murdering black people. And, you know, it's interesting how it's kind of like rooted in this bizarre idea of you know, of being able to, of being upset that people are stealing these mass produced products. Uh, you know, why don't they consider it liberating commodities instead, right? Because we know that those commodities, those mass produced products, they were made through child labor, they were made through exploited uh, wage labor, they were made through prison labor, they were made through sweatshop labor, uh, they were made through labor of the darker peoples of the global south. You know, but for these people, this thinking is a reflex, right? And I would say that a lot of these critiques, they come out of a, reflect, a, a, a reflexive space. It just becomes almost automatic. And they almost can't believe you when you put pressure on them a lot of times. And I'm sure some of you have, might've have had these conversations with um, your own kind of family members where they gave you, you know, maybe pushback for defending looters, right? Oh, why, they're, just, they're really just trying to steal. This impulse, the seemingly automated and default reaction is an inheritance of Exile of you know of of uh, ideologies and discourses that are articulated through capitalism, through white supremacy, through the U.S. nation state, and they're meant to uphold the nation state, white supremacy, capitalism. You know, when we think about the uh, history of policing as fugitive slave patrols, uh, as rooted in fugitive slave patrols, and that's correct. But part of the history of policing and their historic function was precisely, you know, to defend the wealthy and their private property from uh, protests and riots, like those that emerged from labor movements in the, the uh, you know, 19th and early 20th centuries big time. Uh, so again, right, even how that idea of looting and rioting and all that is tied to power, tied to ideologies, right? So critiques of protests of black people, they're nothing new. We've heard before critiques like, why don't they just protest in their neighborhoods, in their own neighborhoods, or why don't they protest black on black crime? And again, right, both of these critiques are both rooted in racist, um, they're actually racist critiques that are masked as innocent questions that, and they're rooted in racist stereotypes um, about black people, right? They ignore real facts, like the fact that black people are constantly fighting to improve their communities and secure black life, or the fact that, you know, protesting police and the city that funds police, but defunds black communities um, to create the conditions for gang violence is actually protesting black on black crime. Right? And the idea of black on black crime itself is a mythology and problematic term that also has racist origins. So, um, you know, it's funny, no one, none of these people that want to critique protests or where people protest are never asking why are police protesting police brutality, especially all those good ones that critics of protest always want to bring up. So 
critiques of riots or looting, um, let's talk about the critiques of rioting and looting, and particularly looting, just because um, police are, uh, and not, yeah, right, and not because police are looting black lives, like Trevor Noah says, or because looting happens every day, whether it's Jeff Bezos looting profit from exploited wage labor or white businesses and developers looting communities of color through gentrification, but because the great irony is this country was literally founded on looting. In a few weeks, we'll celebrate 4th of July that commemorates uh, the U.S. independence. And that was achieved through a revolution that was ignited by, the, ignited by an event called the Boston Tea Party when a bunch of white settlers dressed up as natives and rioted, uh, stormed the boat, and they looted 342 chests of tea leaves and threw them overboard into the Boston Harbor, right? And you know, we can even think about in recent history, the amount of times that white people have rioted, engaged in property destruction, not even for a cause like genocide, Right, but because their favorite sport, uh, their favorite sport team won in a championship, and not once have we ever seen a headline of during those rioting of police brutalizing these people um, or shooting them. It points out right why it's so important to challenge the rhetoric around peaceful protests because it's ahistorical and it's inaccurate. Right, and it's also uh, inaccurate and it's also ahistorical and inaccurate to say uh, peaceful um, to believe that peaceful protests by black people is actually even acceptable. Colin Kaepernick was disciplined and expelled from the NFL for peacefully protesting. Martin Luther, King, Martin Luther King Jr. protested nonviolently and was still assassinated by the federal government. Um, you know, and more dishonorably, the discussion of peaceful protest is actually the co-optation of his legacy that is deployed against his people, right, black people, that he died trying to liberate. It would also be ahistorical and inaccurate to champion peaceful protests as the, legit the legitimate and only way to demand change. If anything, we're seeing the more creative, direct, or intense measures, the, the more that they get crazy, right? The more kind of direct or, uh, and, and intense measures that protest takes, the more that uh, we've been able to secure some of the change of protest demands. So, you know, you can ask yourself, would Minneapolis have pledged to dismantle its police um, or would all four of George Floyd's murderers have been arrested were it not for burning down the third precinct? and the eruptive protests, right? The non-peaceful elements of those protests, you know, that happen. And would Ferguson uh, have become the epicenter of, you know, a black struggle if there was not kind of, if those protests did not escalate and get rowdy? I think it's really important to think about, you know, someone like the anti-colonial thinker Franz Fanon who discussed violence in his book, Wretched of the Earth. And uh, he famously argued for violence. Right, that he said that the colonized sub subject can be necessary for them to regain their uh, regain and assert their dignity um, through violence. You know, Angela Davis has this interview that you can also find on YouTube where she discusses the absurdity of questioning black people on, on this defensive or reactive violence that, that comes out, considering they exist under a system that is relentlessly violent against them. So I want to be clear right now because then I'm probably going to get like 30 messages in my inbox. I'm a pacifist. I'm not advocating for violence. I don't believe in it. Um, I'm simply dismantling this rhetoric around peaceful protest that operates under false premises and again surfaces as a means to detract from the underlying issue of police murdering black people without accountability. And along this, I also think it's important to note how in Ferguson and in Chicago, many people have addressed the role of agent or paid provocateurs in this property damage. And that is not just to make protests look bad in a general sense. It's because they know it will produce discomfort and an incongruence, right? Think about the amount of support that, that these movements have been having, right? When you can frame these protests according to, um, you know, as looting and rioting, which we know, right, jives with dominant ideology and plays into this dominant discourse, then it creates discomfort for people who were just sympathizing with it and could derail right, their support or derail their attention from the focus of police brutality. So we sit here and do this shit, right, so that I have to make a lecture about the legitimacy of protests. Rhetoric around peaceful protests, it's also faulty because it's uh, questionable if a peaceful protest has actually existed, right? So peaceful, peaceful protests in Martin Luther King Jr.'s moment was not actually peaceful. They were actually violent, right? The white onlookers were violent and police were violent. They reacted violently to peaceful protesters. And nonviolent, right, was meant to be, uh, was, not, was not meant to be comfortable. It was actually tactical. It was meant for black people to do what they were not supposed to, which was assert their dignity and their humanity in a society that insisted they have none. And this was enraging, right, to white people because this performance that they were, you know, that they were doing, this demonstration of, of who they are, um, became a comment 
on the violence that, uh, that, that white people knew was upholding their privilege and that um, was predicated in their savage, inhuman, subhuman behavior. So they would frequently attack, right? You have to eliminate the reminder of, of who you are, if who you are is, is bad, right? You have to repress it. When we're thinking about this rhetoric of peaceful protest, power will always find ways to assert, affirm itself and feed itself. So, so much of this rhetoric around peaceful protest meant to route protest, means to route protest behavior in ways that the state finds acceptable or that reify the state. It makes the, the state stronger. A perfect example of this would be when Obama famously said, don't boo, vote. So for Obama, Obama said this, he said it during a speech uh, when he brought up Trump and the audience booed. And his response was, don't boo, vote. Now, this is Obama, right, routing an expression of protest, right? And uh, where does he direct it? He doesn't direct it to the streets. He doesn't tell them to go kind of, you know, do, do, to, to get rowdy. What he says is go to the voting booth, right? Don't boo, vote. And of course he said this and everyone cheered because this is a country that worships and has a very strong uh, ideology that's entrenched in around voting. And it views voting as the premier way of political activity. But again, that also upholds power because what we see so often is people are only politically active every four years for elections and the time leading up to those elections. Um, and it also upholds it because then they learn to never think of themselves as agents of change. They think that they can outsource their agency and their social change work to a representative rather than pursuing it themselves. And so when we think about, you know, this don't boo vote, it's important because that voting booth then is a state sanctioned and respectable way of expressing politics. It's state sanctioned and it also contributes to the state. You're, you're validating the government by voting for it. And it is, uh, and it actually redirects kind of rage or, or, or um, and that energy and that co-op expenditure to strengthening the state. Well, what happens for black people who fought to be able to vote and be politically enfranchised in the 60s? Uh, and it was precisely after right, the civil rights movement that we saw oppression of black people be refined with the rise of the prison industrial complex. Or what happens to all the people who voted for Obama because he promised hope and change? And what we further saw was the concentration of wealth that did fall along racial fault lines. We saw the dispensing of public education that did affect poor working class people of color the most. Uh, Obama did record drone strikes and he did more deportations than any other previous president, right? So that was not hope and change and voting, right? Didn't do that. Actually, a lot of the gains that we've made since then have been through, you know, on the, on the fronts of, you know, whether it's um, for, you know, better labor rights or for better education has been through, has been through protesting, right? It was a teacher strike that finally got Lori Lightfoot to um, concede and give them resources. So the idea that voting is the real way to channel political energy is false, or the idea that it's even the most effective way is also questionable. What's a, a, what I would say the ideology of voting is effective at is limiting people's imagination of all the ways they can participate, and that it's uh, effective at reinforcing the state. And so another reason why this peaceful protest language is dangerous and um, is because it's meant to create an ideology and discourses around protests that also work to uphold the state and that people will also participate in by internalizing these ideas. And part of what this idea of peaceful protest that we keep on hearing and this logic and rhetoric around it is meant, to, what it's meant to do is to separate protesters and create binary of not just good protest and bad protest, but also um, divide protesters according to ideas of good protesters and bad protesters. And, you know, it's the good protesters are those who believe, uh, you know, who behave appropriately and politely and respectably, and then those who are, who are not. This division between protesters, a good and bad protesters, is dangerous for two reasons. The first reason is that designating people as bad protesters legitimizes the criminalization of protesters, um, those protesters who are deemed bad, so that you can arrest them and keep them in jails. And why does this matter? Well, because look at who's considered bad protesters. Right, many bad protesters, uh, many bad protesters, right, that were looters last week, you know, were black people. So it gives the state another chance to further criminalize the already criminalized. And we've actually been seeing that through this pandemic, right? So even when you think about who's been arrested for stay at home orders, I think it's over 90% of all the arrests occurred in the uh, black and brown communities of the South and West Side. And this uh, language of good and bad protesters is also part of a broader logic or technology of how the state breaks up movements. And it does this by dividing them into, um, you know, by dividing the people that make up movements or the people that movements mean to represent into good ones and bad ones. To, and it, when it does that, it absorbs radical energy. 
So we saw this with um, LGBTQ or gay liberation and rights activism, uh, which would eventually, you know, in the in the 2000s become so much focused on marriage equality. And part of this seemed like radical progress, right? And okay, sure, let people, you know, love is love, right? Um, but let's think about this movement. So much of the arguments around it were predicated upon ideas like, I want my partner to be able to receive employment benefits that, you know, that I get through my job, or if I'm sick and dying in the hospital, I want to be able to, to I want my partner to be able to visit me in the hospital. And, you know, that's fine but it also puts into relief who is benefiting from this, right? Uh, normative queers, right? Queers that are assimilated into the mainstream, queers with jobs, queers with healthcare, queers who are normative and believe in marriage, right? Uh, which is a heterosexual and monogamous institution, right? That can often work to perpetuate capitalism because you have kids, they go to school, you're taking out loans, you're buying shit. Um, and who it leaves out, who this leaves out are, um, you know, is the, and further marginalized as we can say are queers of color, working class queers of color, trans people of color, and other non-normative queers. So some people get annexed into protection of the state while others are marginalized and it's uh, further um, compounded. Um, it's important to kind of challenge when you hear these critiques and conversations. Um, you know, and I would say that very often you might not seldomly, actually seldomly will you change the mind of the person that you're engaging but you don't do it for that. You do it for a strategic reason. And that strategic reason is it creates a spectacle and it creates a theater, right? And that theater and that spectacle actually makes the counter discourse, right? When you're, whether you're having it in person or whether you're having it in social media, it creates, you even saying the things, creates an alternative discourse that has pedagogical dividends, right? Because if it's on social media, there's an audience, there's gonna be people that witness it. Right? If you're having it with your family members, you might not convince your father to think otherwise, but you know, your nephew that's sitting right next to you might now get clued in and they're gonna think differently for the rest of their, of their life. And so I think that's really important, right? Is to think about who you're, who you're um, how this how discourse and how these critiques and challenging these critiques, who it affects and how it affects them, right? It'll affect people who are on the fence that you wanna bring over, people who agree but don't have the language. And so now they're gonna learn it and they're gonna be possibly more vocal Right, you're giving people better, better, ar better armor, um, and then you know again, younger people that are listening. Someone said, "Can you address what happened when downtown was closed and things moved to the neighborhoods?" Yeah, I mean, I would say that this is a way in which you can you can actually uh, trace the way power is operating or thinking, right? So you have to think about we have a mayor, and this is not opinion. You can, you know, it's actually fact <laughs> um, that is carrying on the legacy of Rom that is depriving communities of color. I would, I would, I would argue that what she did when, when downtown happened was she intentionally uh, siloed off downtown from being a target of black rage, right? So she lifted up the bridges. She also cut off um, any travel, right? Uh, she cut off the train system. Uh, so she wasn't just cutting off, you know, uh, downtown. I would also argue that she's protecting the wealthier and whiter north side of the city. And so when she did that, right, all of a sudden black rage and somewhere like uh, was left to, and, and the, and the uh, protest rage was left to kind of um, uh, uh, fold in onto itself. And so you saw kind of riots and, 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 and looting erupt in, um, you know, within kind of our own communities of, of color. And, you know, and then escalate to where we, again, do the work for the city for it by kind of attacking each other um, and do the work of white supremacy for it by kind of fighting amongst each other, right? The irony is, you know, you can find videos, I shared one on my own Facebook of police kind of police, police looting um, and, you know, and breaking things. Thank you all for tuning in again. Thank you so much for being a part of the liberation of um, and Black and Tan series. And I hope that we uh, use the knowledge we gained this weekend in actionable ways. The Hudwazi is considering uh, forming working groups based off of this. Um, all right, thank you so much. And I'm going to close this out. See you guys in a little bit during our reprieve hour in 10 to 15 minutes.